what we're presenting at the, uh, at EHA is um, is the it's the they're the final res results of the dose escalation part, so essentially the phase one part of the phase one two study. And what are the uh, objectives of the of the dose escalation part? Obviously, like in almost any phase one study, is to uh, assess safety and and to find the uh, the maximum tolerated do dose, which was not identified because there was no maximum uh, uh, tolerated dose. There was no dose defining or dose limiting toxicity. So it was more like an optimal biological dose or what we call the recommended phase two dose, which will then go on into the expansion or phase two part of the study. As I've already told you that there were no, that there was no dose limiting toxicity and no maximum tolerated dose. Safety is quite manageable uh, with this compound. The class side effect of, of uh, bispecific antibodies such as epcaritumab is cytokine release syndrome. It's not the only side effect, but it's, it is the one that we need to um, be careful about. So cytokine release syndrome basically is a phenomenon which looks very much like infection or sepsis, and it, can, uh, it, it covers a very wide spectrum from mild monosymptomatic fever on one end to very uh, severe state at the other end, needing ICU, multi-organ failure, hypotension, hypoxia, that kind of thing. So much as what we see in serious infections, just without the infectious agent. Um, serious CRS or cytokine release syndrome typically is grades three and four, where you need hospitalization and, and often intensive care. Whereas mild CRS is grade one and two, grade one is just fever. And grade two is fever plus a little bit of typically hypotension, which can be managed with fluid therapy alone. So these are very, very different phenomena. And positively, um, in the study of epcaritumab so far, we have not seen any cases of cytokine release syndrome grade three or four, so only grades one, two. Essentially situations which could be uh, managed uh, with patients being outpatient. Um, now they have all been hospitalized because it's a phase one study, so you need to follow your patients closely and and there are many blood tests and observations to be drawn as well. But essentially, we are looking into a, a drug which looks very manageable in an outpatient setting. So in terms of efficacy, we've had very encouraging data from, from uh, similar molecules. There are, as far as I'm concerned, uh, five of those under clinical development. And um, they have all uh, published preliminary results from, from ongoing phase one studies. And the results that we see with epcaritumab are at least as good as the best of the, uh, of the other drugs. So we have response rates in follicular lymphoma, which is an indolent lymphoma, of right now 86%. And in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is the most common subtype of aggressive lymphomas, or the most common subtypes of lymphoma generally, of uh, 60%, and actually uh, beyond 60% if we're looking only at uh, clean diffuse large piece of lymphoma and not diffuse large piece of lymphoma, which includes lymphomas that have transformed from, from other lymphoma subtypes. It's a bit complicated. But uh, these are very high response rates. Um, generally, uh, until just a few years ago, we would have been pleased to see response rates in these clinical settings of maybe 25, 30, 35 percent. Now we're looking into 60 or 65 percent. Um, with a substantial proportion of these patients actually being complete responders, meaning the disappearance of all uh, signs of disease on the scans. The complete response rates with a caritumab uh, in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma just about 20%, which is at first glance a little bit disappointingly low, but we have to bear in mind that in this study, PET scan was not mandatory, and that leads to an underestimation probably of the complete response rate. So um, all in all, safety and efficacy, very, very encouraging results so far from this study. As we've seen with the other bispecifics, but what is really important from these results, I, I think the most important take home message, apart from the, from the very high efficacy, is the safety signal, which is encouraging. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite unique to, to only see cytokine release syndrome of grades one and two. And even in patients with relatively uh, high risk of CRS, we've only seen CRS of grade one and two.
It's promising. We're looking forward to going to combination studies and the dose expansion of this study. Well, we haven't really seen any new signals from this study because, I mean, what we've seen with the other biospecifics, we've seen cytokine release syndrome ranging from grade one to grade two, so very mild cases, many of those, and a few quite serious cases, even occasionally fatal cases. You've seen that in, in the studies of the other CD3, CD20 biospecifics. Um, and, and these signals are not so dissimilar from the ones that we've seen already with, with CAR-T. I mean, CAR-T and bispecific antibodies have, have many similarities in terms of the mechanisms of action and, and safety profiles. And you see cytokine release syndrome in, in very frequently in the, in the setting of CAR-T. So no new um, clinical uh, uh, signs of CRS, but the, so the new thing is really the, the, uh, the low severity. And also, and this is important to note, Epcaritumab is given subcutaneously, whereas the other bispecifics so far uh, presented are all uh, given intravenously. That doesn't mean they're not being developed for subcutaneous use, but so far we only have results uh, for the IV use of these compounds. And what, we, what, what I've um, observed, at least, is that the onset of cytokine release syndrome and the severity seems to be, the onset is later and the severity is lower. So the, the grades are lower. And, and I think that has to do with the subcutaneous formulation of epcaritumab. So, so while in, for example, clofitumab, uh, with which I've treated uh, many patients with, with lymphomas, you see cytokine release syndrome typically occurring within 12 or maximum 24 hours of the first infusion. With epcaritumab, cytokine release syndrome develops slower. So typically occurring maybe after two or three days rather than within the first day of treatment. So perhaps the subcutaneous formulation makes cytokine release syndrome a little bit more unpredictable, which is not good because predictability is, is uh, good if you manage, want to manage something which is potentially difficult. On the other hand, all the cases are mild. So, so far they have not it hasn't been necessary to be able to predict them. Of course, if you have something which is both severe and unpredictable, then you have a problem. But in, in this case, it's not so predictable as the IV use of glufitumab in my example, but the severity is, is not, it's not as, as serious. So, uh, so it looks like a good trade-off. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the main difference. It's the severity, which is, which is not as bad, and then the, uh, the, the timing of onset. A cytokine release syndrome is a, it's, it's something we can treat when it happens. We're treating uh, with antipyretics and, and pressors uh, to, to get the blood pressure back to normal, oxygen treatment, fluid resuscitation, that kind of thing. We have antibodies to control uh, elements of the cytokine release, anti interleukin-6 and interleukin-6 receptor antibodies. And these, these treatments are really quite effective. So we can manage these situations in the vast majority of cases. Um, but another important step is to mitigate. So to prevent the, uh, the happening of, C of CRS or at least prevent CRS to develop in high grades. And this is done across all the studies in similar ways, uh, in the way that we all studies use what we call step-up dosing. So you start with a relatively low dose and typically go over an intermediate dose after a week and then end with a full dose at the end of cycle one or the beginning of cycle two of treatment. This is more or less the same with all the different bispecifics and it's used with epcaritumab as well. Now epcaritumab, uh, like I said, is given subcutaneously and from the signal that I can observe it looks as though the subcutaneous use itself is a mitigation. You can almost imagine how when you give something subcutaneously you, you do not have the same very high peak concentration as when you give something intravenously. And that sort of more flat curve, very popular now in these corona days, but this is different, the flat curve of the uh, of the initial uh, availability of the of the antibody in the in the bloodstream seems to be itself a mitigation of severe CRS.